And there's things we can do. And it starts with people being informed and engaged. It really does. There's so many different things that the media can do to expose people to programs that have some success, have success, you know, they're not perfect, but they have some success involved with them. Some ways that we can penetrate people's minds and try to change things. One of the biggest projects I'm working on now, and I've had modest success at best, is to change the television format inside the jail. Because, by and large, because people confuse prisons and jail. Prisons, you go for a set period of time, so you know when your people are coming in and out of there. And so you can put them in programs because you know when they're leaving. At jail, I honestly don't know if someone's going to be with me one hour or ten years. I have no idea. They're, by and large, all of them are there waiting on their trials. And that can go on for God knows how long. And so for me to try to put programming together for them is very, very difficult because I don't know who's going to be there. The one thing, though, that is consistent is they all have these opportunities, extensive opportunities to be in their day rooms where what are they doing? They're either playing checkers, they're reading a book, or they're watching TV. They're watching TV. And my obsession has been to change what it is that they're watching so that we're trying to get some stuff of quality into them that they're watching, but not have it on such a highbrow level where we're trying to feed people something that clearly they're not going to understand. And so once again, through the communication skills that you guys are developing, could you come up with ways that we can try to work with the people that are in there when you have them for this extended period of time glued in front of a television set, giving them something of quality? Yeah, we could do that. But I need young people with ideas who are going to get engaged with that. And so within your sphere, could people help with that? Oh, God, yeah, they can help with that. But if you're getting involved with radio and TV, work on things that are of substance. Work of things that matter. Don't just sit around and chase these goofy stories that, frankly, don't mean anything to our society as a whole. It means zero. And so one of the things that's always funny for me is because the people in politics, usually you know, you're brought up to hate the media. I actually not only don't hate them, I feel sorry for them. The reason I feel sorry for them is the majority of the ones that I deal with are good people who got involved with it because they want to get involved with stories that mattered. Instead, they're told right now, well, the public just wants to hear trash, so you go out and follow trash. And so people who really want to spend weeks working on a subject and building up a really neat type of piece are told you have about a half hour to go do something and do something that's mildly entertaining to people. And so they don't want it that way, but that's the way things are going in these days. And it's very unfortunate. It's horribly unfortunate. So once again, it's incumbent upon people like you, if you get into positions where you're working in the media world and you have the opportunity to be in the executive side of it, push some things of substance. You know, I know the public might sit there and say, we'd rather hear about Lindsay Lohan. Well, guess what? We're not going to do that this week. We're actually going to do something that matters. And so we need to have more of that going on. And so, as I say, from my perspective, it's strange because most of the people in my world hate the media. I feel bad for them because I know most of them really want to do something that matters. Instead, they are forced right now to churn out a lot of garbage, a lot of garbage. And then the one thing that always eats at me, too, is that they feel compelled, absolutely compelled, they have to give both sides of the story, even if there is no other side of a story. I mean, believe it or not, folks, and I don't know if you got the memo, there is a thing called right and wrong in this world. There is some. Okay? Sometimes someone is just dead wrong, absolutely wrong. But yet, some, I, I can't tell you how often the media feels compelled, well, we've got to give the other side of the story. There is no other side. And yet, well, we've got to give it. Why is that? Well, we have to be fair. Fair to what? Shouldn't you at some point be trying to seek out the truth in what is right and wrong? And so, with me, as I say, that has been a constant problem I've had with the media, but it's more now this sense of pity that you have very good people who want to be involved in doing things that matter instead are being pushed more and more into a format that doesn't lend itself to that. So as you guys go forward, please do everything you can to do that because there's big things at stake here. As they say, our society has more issues and they keep multiplying. And if we have a disengaged electorate who is ignorant of the important issues, things are not going to get any better. So I'd be happy to answer questions, though. I just have a question with law enforcement in the city of Chicago and dealing with media and how we concentrate on one shooting in one part of the country or we concentrate on violence other places, whereas, you know, violence in the city of Chicago is unlike anywhere else in the country. So how does the law enforcement look at how things are not portrayed in like how they should be national news and this should be something that we should be concentrating on, but we don't. And how does the law enforcement side of that feel? I, th I, th I think most of the people involved in law enforcement feel um, a, a degree of upset 
only from the standpoint that something that should be more noteworthy, like someone being killed, frankly, the, the frequency it occurs doesn't really get that much of attention. And so do you get the cases where they're horrific in nature and so they get a lot of attention? Yeah, you get those. But the day in, day out uh, of killing of people that occur, all these different lives have value to them. And I think in law enforcement, you then end up eventually getting a little bit numb to it because it happens with some degree of frequency and it doesn't seem to be something that is of greater note. And so it, it is a different world here in Chicago than you get some of the other places because clearly if some of the events that were occurring here were to be going on at some other locations, there would be a lot more notoriety and upset about it. Um, but here there is a sense of numbness that comes through it and it's, it's very troubling. All right, I have a question. You asked that um, what could the youth um, portray to some type of programs for people that are actually in the in jail and what you could do. Well, I would think like, well, I know it's hard for people to get out of jail to get jobs or whatnot. And it's like, they have to learn a skill. Mm -hmm. If they're doing time, they have to do time for a purpose or whatnot. And like this program, it's a year program, but they actually help you, you know what I'm saying, get a job or whatnot. But you can't get a job if you're coming out of jail. So obviously, you know what I'm saying, the only other way to make money is to do what you're not supposed to do, mm -hmm. which is sell drugs and all the other negative things to, you know, to come to income, which causes people to go back to jail. And I pretty much think that's part of the, what mm -hmm. was the word again? A recidivism. Yeah, recidivism. And that makes that go higher because especially out here, and another thing with the music and the violence, it's just um, that's how Chicago is portrayed. And I know, you know, mm -hmm. you know, it's a beautiful city. So I believe that um, we could do a lot more definitely to help in jailhouse things and maybe like come up with a program. I definitely would like to help you with that too. Yeah, and, then, um, and see that's the thing that I'd like is see to get the creativity of someone like yourself who would come up with something different. And I always tell people, I go, you can start from the premise that if you look at our numbers, uh, what we're doing right now isn't working. So you couldn't conceivably screw it up any worse than it is. So that's always a good way to start things off. It's like, well, good, I can't make it any worse. But the, the thing that's always fascinating is I, I, I'll talk to a lot of the detainees because my office is in the jail. So I'll wander around and talk to them. And uh, I have, in, I always, I don't ask them about their case. I used to be a prosecutor, so I, I used to try people. I'm not interested in, you know, their case. I'm interested in what we can do to sort of break the cycle with them. And so I always ask them, I go, well, what is it that you're going to tell me that's going to make me think that you're not going to come back here? And I'll have guys honestly look at me and say, you know, Sheriff, I'm probably coming back. And they'll tell me flat out, they'll say, I'll do this. And, and I know this stuff, but it's sort of neat hearing it from them because it's so stark then. They'll say, listen, when I leave, I had a hard time from the area that I came from finding a job beforehand. When I leave here, I'm going to have a felony conviction now. What do you think the chances of me getting a job are? And I'll tell him, well, not real good. He said, I got to feed myself. He goes, I can always get a job dealing dope. You know, I can go sling dope. I can make money to survive. It's hard to argue with that. What am I going to sit there and say? No, no, no. You should go on to Harvard. Well, of course, well, that's they not. Hiring. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, exactly. That's why. And so you're trying to deal with the realities of it. And so that's why with the people I've been trying to work with, and as I say, I've had modest luck at this. I've been trying to get people to help me come up with like some TV programming programs in general that are actually real. You know, they're dealing with the real world as opposed to the world we all wish we lived in. And that's where there's been this disconnect. It seems like a lot of the people that get involved with putting these programs together come from um, relatively wealthy backgrounds and really don't know what the streets are about. And so they're well-meaning, but I look at some of the stuff they put on and said, this isn't connecting with me. This certainly isn't going to connect with a guy who has like a maybe a high school education, who's been dealing dope for the last five years, who wants to get out but doesn't see the path to it. And you got to be a little bit more clear here. And they don't seem to get it. So anything you guys could come up with would be good because, as they say, we're trying to reorganize all the television in there. It's a little trickier than I thought. But at the end of the day, I guess the one part of it is I run the damn place. So if I want to turn the TV off, switch a different channel on, I can do that. I obviously will do it with some degree of thought so they don't consider, um, you know, have a mini little riot going on there. But if people are come up with me some content that would connect with people, I mean, that would be huge. And put it this way, I always say to people, listen, if we just get one out of 10, it's better than what we're doing right now. And sometimes you, you get that thing that clicks with someone. All of a sudden he's sitting there saying, you know what, that makes sense to me. Maybe I will try that. And then we give them some avenues to it. So please pursue that. Um, we have been for years. We have uh, a guitar program, but we only have um, 
10 spaces, so I have a long waiting list on that. So we have a music element to it. We also have a chess program. And the reason we do that is it makes people think differently. It wasn't necessarily them thinking all these guys are going to come out of there and they're going to be grandmaster chess, you know, like, nah. It's, you think differently. And so we got waiting lists on that like you wouldn't believe e either. And a matter of fact, we did something really cool last year where I had the former champion of the world, uh, chess master, uh, Anatoly Karpov was his name. He flew in from Russia, set this thing up where my detainees via Skype played Russian prisoners in a chess tournament last year. And we did okay. We got beat, and I knew we would because I had a feeling that uh, Vladimir Putin wasn't going to let us win. Uh, so uh, I was just happy that we won some of the games and our guys walked away feeling pretty good about it too. And so we've been doing things like that, but our new thing that I came up with is teaching guys how to get involved with deconstruction. So we have all these abandoned buildings all over the place, and there's towns and villages that have no money to take them down. So we're teaching the guys the skill on how to take them apart. They then recycle all the you know, brick, and if there is any metal left, usually that's all taken. Uh, recycle all that stuff, but it's a skill that they can leave because they, when they leave the jail, people want that type of skill and they don't really care as much that you have a criminal background, so they might hire you. So we're trying to come up with programs where it won't matter that you have a criminal background and just like you saying, trying to deal with sort of like the real world and it's like not giving them, you know, not teaching them how to repair typewriters. It's like, well, that's brilliant. You know, we don't have typewriters anymore, you idiot. So we're trying to come up with stuff that there's a real connection there and we have three farms now. The guys all run the farms, not just growing the stuff, but we also sell it at like the farmer's market at the Daily Center. We always have a booth there, and the guys running the booth are um, inmates. They're detainees. So we are trying to do it, but we're looking for more ideas and suggestions because it's just something that you got to do, and just housing people is, is really dumb. Um, my question is, gun laws are changing rapidly now. How is that affecting the way you police in gun laws? So the gun laws have been... Particularly troublesome for us is that we have the new hook with the concealed carry, but beyond that, the gun laws are so horribly ineffective. They just don't give you any ability to do anything until after bad things have occurred, as opposed to doing stuff on the front end. It is really hard. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Thank you. For oh, thank you so much. Thank you. You're so welcome.